please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Watching Trading Hour on CNBC TV 18. Well, it's turning out to be a day of consolidation, really, for the markets at this point in time. So the Nifty is at around 10,243. Oh, those, that's the poll number which is flashing on the screen. But nonetheless, we have a lot of stocks in focus in today's trading session. We have Bajaj Auto, which is going to be coming out with its numbers. Not to mention, we have ACC, Wipro, Axis Bank, all of them, which will be releasing numbers today. So it's a very heavy day when you're talking about a lot of stocks in focus. Focus, Federal Bank, DCB reacting to numbers. So a lot uh, to s talk about also, especially from the financial space. But overall, it seems as though the mid caps are outperforming at this point in time. So we're half a percent higher currently for the mid cap index. And the bank nifty not doing too badly. So we're up around three tenths of a percent currently for the bank nifty as well. So overall, looking good, looking steady for the markets, just about consolidating with a po positive bias for the frontliners post the strong run that we saw yesterday. Hi, Prashant. Ekta, hi, good morning. And uh, the market, uh, I mean, just there, not really uh, breaking out or anything. As you said, lots of earnings, so maybe mm. we'll have more stock-specific action, more uh, idiosyncratic moves rather than the broader market continuing to move up like it has for the last so many our trading sessions now. I mean, with the exception of one day, which is last Wednesday, you just go back and see, it's basically been higher highs and higher lows. And that has absolutely been a bullish and uh, great sign uh, that we've had so far. Uh, Ikta, this is a graphic which is actually pretty interesting. Mm. And, uh, you know, we all say, we all talk in terms of Nifty. How much is Nifty up compared uh, from this date to this date? Or how much is, I mean, you know, compare Nifty to other markets. But, uh, you know, what have stocks done within the index? Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about the Nifty index, which is only 50 stocks. But, so this is a study which uh, was done by Investec, the broker. And what they essentially did is uh, sort of put a threshold of minimum market capitalization of 500 crores. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the purpose of, uh, of this study, minimum market cap considered was 500 crores. In India, they found about 915 stocks or so, uh, which, which kind of sort of on the NSE, which meet the criteria. Now, they looked at since the 1st of January 2014, how many stocks have gone up two times, three times, four times? Uh, I'm just putting out three times and four times. And that kind of just will tell you the scale of the move. Mm. You know, the market might be up, whatever, 10%, uh, 10%, 15%, 20%. But look at the number of stocks which have trebled uh, and uh, gone up four times. If, if, so let's just start with India. Uh, actually, you can put, we could have put in one more column, which, which is 2x. 2x, 3x, 4x. Uh, so 2x is doubler. In India's case, 70% of uh, the uh, uh, sort of category which was considered, the group of stocks which was considered about 915 stocks, stocks with greater than 500 crore market capitalization, 70% of those stocks doubled. 50% of those stocks went up three times. And almost 40% of the stocks went up four times. You compare it to any other market. I mean, you know, I just uh, picked out three markets, China, Korea, and Indonesia. And that mm -hmm. same market capitalization filter was applied, of course, uh, with the relevant uh, sort of exchange uh, uh, you know, exchange rate conversion, etc. In India, in China's case, 11% of the relevant uh, sort of group of stocks went up three times, and 4% went up four times. Mm. You look at Korea, that number is three and two percent. In Indonesia, there is six percent and four percent. I mean, uh, uh, you know, so and if we actually had looked at India, China, Korea, Indonesia, and the benchmark indices, the difference would not be that wide. It will not be that much. But of... the number mm. of stocks which have gone up and uh, you know, sort of given us these staggering moves. I think it just puts India in a completely different league. This is basically the last three years and, what, 10 months, I mean, at, as of as of now. So since the 1st of January 2014, this broadly also kind of sort of coincides with uh, from when Mr. Modi took power at the centre. I mean, uh, you know, with a couple of months here and there. But I think it kind of sort of gives us the full import of uh, the the scale of the rally that we've witnessed over the last uh, three years and 10 months. Yes, absolutely. So it gives you a sense in terms of the absolute number of stocks which have risen as compared to other markets. But let's get talking on uh, the technicals then. We have Sudarshan Sukhani joining in uh, to discuss exactly that. Hi, Sudarshan. Um, morning to you. Well, it seems as though the festive cheer is still sprinkling onto the Nifty, but more for the mid-cap index. So what would you be recommending? Yeah, good morning again. 
Well, the festive cheer has come in and, and it's stable and it's staying there. And that's good news because quite often Diwali becomes a sort of lopsided uh, situation when the markets actually weaken. This is a very different October and a very different Diwali. Well, the Nifty is a buying of, is a long position opportunity. You must be long in the Nifty and stay long. There is a tight stop loss which is 10,100. But so far as the index stays above it, we want to be on the long side. Mid caps are offering so many opportunities. We had this fascinating study which Prashant was just talking about. But for today, ACC is a buying opportunity. A V-shaped rally in ACC continues to strengthen. Hexaware is a buy. Hexaware is not just a day trading buy. You could actually consider building a position in it. It's coming out of a very large consolidation and making new highs. So it's a very attractive investing opportunity for the short in, short term investor. Finally, Indigo is a short sell. It's a choppy market. Indigo is weakening, making lower lows. But generally, stay on the long side. Okay, let's get some Twitter queries uh, answered as well from Sudarshan. Uh, and uh, the first one is from uh, Mr. K. Srinivasan. He has 1,000 shares of Hindustan Zinc. He purchased them at 261 rupees a share. He wants to know whether to hold or sell. Sudarshan? Oh, he must hold. Hindustan Zinc has been an outperformer. It's a blue chip company. There's a relative outperformance versus a nifty versus a metal sector. So you are in a good stock stay. This is the beginning of a long term bull market. Don't be in a hurry to exit. Just stay with it. Okay, well, uh, that is uh, the query which is coming in on Hindustan Zinc. But the other one, Sudarshan, is from Lalita. She has 100 shares of Biocon, which she's bought at 356. And she wants to know whether to hold or to sell. What would your recommendations be? And happy Diwali to you as well, Lalita. Yes. Uh, my recommendation would be to hold. Biocon has already gone through a deep correction, a mini bear market. It's now bottoming out. You've bought it. You know, this market will reward traders and investors who have the patience to stay with the stocks. Don't be a very short-term trader. Just hold on to it and you will find that you will get good rewards. Stay for at least six months and you will see higher levels. All right, uh, Sudarshan, thanks very much. Good speaking with you. We, of course, touch base soon again in a bit from now. Uh, 12 points on the Nifty, 10,243 is where we are. Let's also get some futures and option strategies from Gaurav Bisser of LKP Securities. Gaurav, good morning. Good to have you here. What would you trade? Good morning. The first recommendation would be buy on Aurobindo Pharma. Uh, if you look at for last five to seven trading sessions, there was some sort of short curve that we saw, and it propelled stock from 725, 730 zone to around 760, 765, the current market price. Uh, now we are seeing over addition happening, and this level, uh, it's a very strong resistance level, 760, 765 zone. So if you have a close around these levels, I would not be surprised with the 7, 8 percent up move coming next three to four trading sessions. For a trading per se, for two day trade, one can have a surplus of 735, go long in Aurobindo Pharma for seven. 97 and 5 uh, kind of levels. Second, we buy on uh, Ashok Lidhan. Uh, this is another name to see a lot of uh, short covering coming in. It was predominantly because 125 call option had a very high concentration. For last two months, it has been trying to uh, gain grounds over 125. That has not been the case and that resulted in good amount of uh, short selling in uh, 125 call option. Now, the next ha highest uh, OI is seen at 130 levels and above 130, it can even test levels of 137, 138. So, on that premise, one can have a stop loss of 126.5, uh, play for 131, 132 kind of levels for next uh, three to four trading sessions. And final recommendation would be buy on Century Textile. It's more of a technical call. It's been trading in a range. 12 is a very strong support bouncing from those levels. So using that as a stop loss, uh, one can play for 1325, 1330 kind of levels in Century Textile for next three to four days. Okay, fair enough. Um Thanks uh, very much for that. Well, uh, we're going to leave it on that note in terms of strategies. Well, I just want to pick up one stock. Aurobindo should come up for you because uh, just some time ago, they had received approval. They've announced that they've received approval for Nexium Generic, which is basically used for acid reflux slash heartburn. Uh, issues. It's important because it's going to be a limited competition drug for them uh, where there's only one more company which received approval in August of 2017. Uh, so that's Perigio. So that means that uh, they can, Aurobindo can make up to around, say around $40 million if in case this continues to be a limited competition drug. And that's the reason that you're seeing that spike up come into today's trading sessions. That's the markets uh <laughs> I mean, right there, 15, 16 odd points, 10,250 odd is where we're trading at. Half a uh, percent higher on the mid cap, 18,874. 
So broader market doing just a uh, little bit better compared to the frontline indices. Manisha is now joining in with how gold demand is looking on Dantheos today. Manisha, good morning. Thank you so much for that, Prashant. Well, it is looking good because that's the kind of report we're getting in from the markets there. Last year wasn't so good. 2016 Indian consumption was the lowest in seven years. So this year you are looking at 15 to 25 percent of a jump up in demand for this month itself for the festivities. That is, it is Dhanteras today, which marks the five day uh, festivities, Diwali, etc. All starts from today itself. And gold, of course, has been an intrinsic part of India given the kind of purity that we attach to it and the fortune, wealth, etc. It also is known as Istridhan. So a, a lot of cultural, uh, economical, emotional values attached to gold is what leads to buying in, not just in gold, but in silver, diamond, jewelry, etc. A lot of that is out in buying today. It also is about the wedding season that kickstarts in the next month. And a lot of that buying also gets pre-pawned into these auspicious days. And that is the reason you see those higher footfalls coming in there. Uh, but having said that, uh, it, there is various ways on buying into gold. There is physical in sense of gold bars and jewelry. And then, of course, you have the derivative market where you have the futures. And, of course, the gold options have been launched today as well. And then yet another, you have the gold ETFs, gold funds, and the government of India's sovereign gold bond scheme as well. That tranche is also open until December 13th. So you have to talk about what kind of trends are the market seeing when it comes to buying into the jewelry. Tanya, hi. Good to have you. How are the markets looking? Because as compared to Hi. previous year, with so much has happened in sense of demonetization, GST, the revision or taking back of PMLA Act, etc., uh, what is the impact that it has had? So, Manisha, that is literally a billion dollar question, I would say. So, uh, you know, the thing is that you're right. It was a horrible year for jewelers last year. So, but then this has been even worse because uh, um, I think the work, it, since demonetization, the market size has been cut off by about 40 to 45 percent. That is about, you know, so this year it is estimated, the World Gold Council estimated that we're going to import somewhere around 650 to 750 tons of gold, which is uh, as compared to 1,000 tons minimum, which we used to do before. Mm. So it's been a great uh, setback for our industry. That said, uh, the gold pent up, the demand for gold in the country cannot just go away. It's an intrinsic and cultural thing, and they do buy gold. It's a national hobby to follow what the gold rate is. Mm. So, you know, the pent up demand for the entire year has uh, resurfaced, has resurged. And I think, even uh, as per the statistics, the currency level is also at the pre demonetization level. So, the last, and also, luckily, you know, it's been a, it's been serendipitous that we have uh, a small correction in the gold uh, prices. So, the past few days we've really seen a nice surge in demand of the gold jewelry not so much the bullion but gold jewelry surely hmm. yes Tanya, also coming on the fact that uh, a lot of policy reforms that the government seems to be making has led to uh, yes. uh, you know the industry into a more organized structure there's more transparency there is of course some transition that we have seen coming because of GST as well yes Absolutely. So uh, the fact is, this is actually a good move. They're also coming up with this, uh, like, you know, mandatory hallmarking yes. for the entire jewelry, which is, again, a very positive mood. So uh, it was the only problem was that all of all of that happened together at once. So the compliance was a little bit of an issue. GST was very, the, the entire industry was uneducated about it. The authorities were a little bit uneducated about it. Let me say that though, hmm. very clearly. So the whole process was a little painful. But as I said, that any transition is usually painful. So the entire mode is going to be uh, definitely positive on that. Though we did suffer a small interim loss in business because of that. Like for instance, September itself, so as soon as the GST rolled out, so the, um, the importing gold is actually 5% lower than last year, which was already a low. Sure. So uh, for September, ex except, yeah, but the first half of the entire year was a good year, you know, since last, uh, if you compare it to the like the last quarter of uh, 2016 to the first quarter of 2017, hmm. uh, the demands for the gold were double of what the imports rather were at least double and which is exactly uh, you know proportional to the demand of the gold in the country mm. so Tanya one more thing that I want to put out for our viewers is when somebody does go out to buy gold in a physical form today what all yeah. should we be looking into our bills is it the hallmarking is it the GST making charges purity essaying what all should one keep an eye on 
So the fact is that GST is honestly actually making things simpler because there used to be all kinds of uh, state taxes. 10% import duty is always already there in the gold. Making is of course always, always there. But then there were so many state taxes which have been done away with. And the uh, surge up is not really that much. It's just about 1 to 2% extra it's fine, no? as of now in some states. In fact, uh, in fact, in South India, it's a little cheaper, to be uh, frank. So, uh, so there's going to be GST, there's going to be making charges, and there's going to be uh, the rate of gold, which is already a little lower than uh, last week. Okay, all right, Tanya. Thanks very much for joining in and Manisha for uh, joining in. We're, we're going to keep touching base with you to get more updates in terms of how and exactly... I'm hoping I can influence you to go out and buy gold and silver or even diamonds today. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, let's just go for the solitaires then. Oh, totally. Uh, Prashant, I, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> you but, <were> shut. <laughs> uh, but in any case, we're going to keep getting back to you to find out the on-ground reality on whether people are buying as much as last year or not. Uh, we'll take a break now, but up next, we're going to be speaking to the management of Texmaco Rail on the company's Q2 performance, which was disappointing. The <coughs> management of Texmaco Rail, it in fact delivered what was a weak set of numbers with the company posting a net loss of around 8.3 crores this quarter. Mr. A.K. Vijay, the CFO and the ED of the company, now joins in to discuss this quarterly performance with us. Mr. Vijay, hi, thank you very much uh, for joining in. Well, it's been another loss for you this quarter and it seems as though uh, your heavy engineering business was uh, one of the key culprits where the revenue was down around 65 odd percent. Can you just tell us what transpired there? Yeah, first of all, let me wish all my viewers to have, have very happy Dhanteras. And yeah, we have a disappointing result for the quarter two. As I mentioned in the last interview that on the, while presenting results for Q1, that our Q1 and Q2 performance are expected to be a little <coughs> disappointing. A reason being this thing that the company was in a transformation stage and we were emerging as a major rail EPC company from earlier a mere wagon builder. Now, that transformation certainly takes its own time to do, but then we are on the right on the track. And we expect from quarter three, the performance will slightly pick up. Q4 should be very good. And next year, we expect the performance to be much better than what we have been doing. Now, coming back on your question that as to why uh, the performance for your our <coughs> engineering division, heavy engineering division, it was not up to the mark. The reason being simple. Heavy engineering was predominant, dominantly dependent upon orders from railways for wagons. And railways wagon procurement have been little slightly erratic because there have no, not been any procurement for this financial year till now. Fortunately, the tender is likely to finalize now sometime in the month of early November. Once that tender is finalized, we can certainly start building the wagons for the supply to the railways. So that division will start picking up. But simultaneously, we have shifted other areas of having works, which will certainly make company in good stead. Number one, we are moved into in a big way on the local market. And since the demand for the locomotives are too high today in the current context, both from GE, Alstom, as well as from the railway's own workshops. So we have built up a very healthy order book. And deliveries, of course, will start from for GE, Alstom from uh, next year onwards only. But for uh, the railway workshop, the delivery is urgent and we are already picking up on that those deliveries. So that's one thing segment where we are really looking good. Our order book has already crossed 600 crores and we expect it to further go up. Similarly, in my steel foundry division, which was, we ex all along mentioned that we have set up a, one of the most modern steel foundries, which cater, can cater to the export demands. This demand, we have taken a long time to build up the market for this. But then today, I am I'm happy to share with all my viewers that Today, the, uh, our foundry is the not only the only approved foundry for supply to American market, but the American customers are coming in droves. And in fact, rather, my requirement for this year, which I earlier projected that maybe about we will be meeting about 25 to 25 to 26 percent of the total capacity as to export, I'll be touching more than 30 percent for purpose of export in this year itself. And from next year onwards, I'm targeting more than 50 percent. This certainly, and that to supply to the developed countries, will make steel foundry division as stand of its own, absolutely identified, and in Indian market, this will be a jewel in the account. Now, coming back on the other division of the company working Let me street. just interrupt you here. Uh, the two parts, one is this uh, wagon tender will be what, 15,000, 20,000? 9,500 numbers. 9,500. And the tender will be put together in November for bidding. 
नहीं इट इज ऑलरेडी बिडेड द एक्सपेक्टेड फाइनलाइजेशन इज फाइनलाइजेशन ऑल दी ओके द अवार्ड विल हैपन इन नवंबर यू सेड दैट्स राइट फेयर इनफ uh you said you are transforming yourself into a epc a real epc company but even in that yeah, division yeah even that even that division uh, sort of uh, performance are performance is quite disappointing can you talk to us about yeah. that yeah yeah uh, i just coming on the real epc now hmm. in real epc basically the performance second quarter should have been much better but because of disruption which was caused by gst and you know pretty well in these cases there are small contractors traders suppliers and all everyone was impacted to this there was a lot of confusion in the market for mm. initial couple of months resultant thing was this thing virtually we have not done anything in the month of july and august <coughs> and only in the later part of september we started picking up but whatever we have lost we'll make up in the next two quarters that is pretty sure about this thing and our uh, all the projects are well and execution in fact railway stimulus special and was that the projects must be executed fast in the pipeline there are huge, large number of tenders there are not many players to complete those requirements sure. certainly this segment will certainly look up in the next coming quarters and for the next few years this is where the main demand is going to emerge okay fair this enough part, sir let me tell you about the rail epc one more thing about sure this is what we are talking about the indian market we have uh, scouted through the international market and all this thing and there is a very big demand for this segment in international market as well and we are now in hmm. getting a stepping into the international market which certainly will be making this division a total outstanding division for the purpose of the company's financial workings okay sir just before we let you go uh, ju i just need a one word answer from you if you have yeah. to if you have to attribute how much you lost out of um, gst in terms of your sales this quarter how much would it be say in percentage terms it is if you take my total turnover for this division was hardly close to 80 90 crores and virtually i i could have done 100% more than that okay this apart one more important thing for the rail epc segment that that is why we have taken a call to merge sure. bright power now the today scenario the railway is looking forward to okay get an expansion done for electrification which this division certainly will be looking into and today my order book there is also is close to 600 crores All which right. certainly will make All right sir so we've completely lost your link also it's jittering a bit but thank you very much for joining in and talking to us so that is the view coming in from Texmaco uh poor set of numbers but they are probably going to uh, they are envisaging some amount of improvement in the coming quarters but let's get talking on the technicals now we have Ashwini Gujral back with us to discuss the technicals Ashwini hi over to you so then uh, what would you recommend one on the nifty as well as um, the outperformance on the mid cap index See the Nifty, uh, you know, early morning dip has been bought, and uh, we are now, I think, uh, almost above uh, yesterday's high. So that way, uh, the uptrend continues. And today, you know, at one point, all sectors were in the red, and that has come back substantially. So that way, I think, continues. And today, you know, at one point, all sectors were in the red, and that has come back substantially. So that way, I think. Uh, Uh, more upside is there and large stocks are leading it because the advanced decline continues to remain negative probably mid caps will uh, catch up later on but uh, it looks like a strong market banks have uh, kind of uh, come back uh, today so uh, chances are we'll move forward from 10250 uh, as far as individual stocks are concerned united spirits is a buy at the top of 2420 target of uh, 2565 <coughs> Yes Bank is a buy with a stop of 368 target of 385 and uh, BPCL is a buy with a stop of 500 target of 535 we saw that uh, I mean you have a call on United Spirits but we saw that big uh, move on uh, Radico Ashwini uh, did you trade that any existing call there well Radico is a, a smaller stock probably more a portfolio stock i don't think it, uh, it's as much a trading stock but uh, i think uh, in the spirit space this is a swing trade where you know united spirits goes back to say about 27 2800 radico seems like uh, you know it's trying to price in some sort of event uh, it's gone past its uh, you know uh, october uh, or rather january 2008 high so in terms of uh, the move i think from here radico could have another 100 150 point move on the upside Okay, fair enough. Well, Twitter queries now. Um, Ashwini, the first one is from Mohammed P. Hundred shares of Bajaj Finance, which he's bought at nineteen thirty-nine. He wants to know whether to hold or to sell. What's your advice on that? 
Well, yesterday was a good time to add on. I think you'll get 24, 2500. Uh, you know, 1850 or uh, yesterday's low can be a decent stop. So no problem in holding and even adding on. Okay, fair enough. Uh, we have Abhishek Sinha, 752 shares of PFC, Power Finance, uh, which he's bought at an average price of 96.43 from 2011. He wants to know whether to hold it for one year or further, uh, for further gains or to sell it now. Should not hold it at all. <laughs> because as you can see, you know, it's done poor, uh, mm. you know, worse than an FT. So get into an LNT finance. Hmm. Probably uh, that's a much better NBFC and it'll probably give you much better returns going forward. Okay, uh, <clears throat> fair enough. Those are Twitter queries. Ashwini, uh, you had a call I saw in the morning, BEML, or was it? I mean, I think uh, you were recommending a buy. Call still holds, 1810. Yeah, absolutely. Today is a fresh breakout. Hmm. It had seven, eight days of sideways moves. And you know, finally, BEML at some point will get to 2000. So today is a good day to get back into BEML. Okay, previous all-time high was about 1950-ish or so. Ashwini, thanks very much. We speak with you in about an hour's time uh, again. So the, those are uh, there's a technical perspective on the market. On to a CNBC TV18 exclusive now. We learned from sources that the insurance regulator is looking to change norms to help increase private equity investments in the in insurance companies. Uh, Yash is now essentially joining us with these exclusive details. Yash, good morning. Well, Prashant, let me first uh, put things in perspective. The IRDA chairman very recently had mentioned that uh, the insurance regulatory body is working on regulations to allow private equity investments to invest in insurance companies. Now, what we are given to understand here is that the consultation process for this has already begun and IRDA, which is the insurance regulatory body, essentially intends to allow private equity players to invest over 10% in insurance companies, which will also also enable these private equity players to attain the promoter status in these insurance companies. Remember, currently private equity players are only allowed to invest up to 10%, which does not give them the promoter status. Also, what we are given to understand is that uh, this particular proposal of raise in threshold for the private equity investments in insurance companies will be based on the exit policy, which will be a very important element. Here, what I'm given to understand that uh, there is a suggestion which will be discussed, uh, which is to introduce a lock-in period for these private equity investments of over 10% of five years, which is essentially being discussed with a simple logic of bringing in more sustainable and more sticky capital in the insurance space. Uh, consultation process within the insurance regulatory body for this particular proposal has already begun, post which there will be a, a consultation process with the industry representatives as well as market regulators, SEBI, so that there is no clash in regulations between the two regulators and IRDA targets to bring out a white paper in the next one to two months. Okay, fair enough. Um, thanks very much for that, uh, Yash. But uh, we do have a press release from DB Realty, so maybe we should just pull up the stock as well. They have said that further to their letter dated 12th October, this is to inform you that DB Realty and LIC Housing Finance have arrived at a settlement and have executed a debt settlement agreement which was dated October 16, 2017. So that's of yesterday and that's the reason that you're seeing that spike up come in mostly, most prominently on DB Realty because LIC Housing Finance, this is one of their accounts. For DB Realty, this would be a bigger uh, relief. And uh, pursuant uh, there to LIC has on October 16th withdrawn the application made by it in the NCLT or the National Company Law Tribunal against DB Realty and the said application by LI LIC therefore stands disposed of as withdrawn. So this, uh, so there's basically no bankruptcy proceedings against DB Realty. It's been um, removed or it's been uh, taken back by LIC Housing after that debt settlement which they've gotten into, which took place yesterday. And as we talk, we can see that sort of spike up coming through up around 17 to 89% for DB Realty. So it also shows some amount of, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of settlements which can come through when there is an NCLT process also involved. So this would be actually a big relief which is coming in for DB Realty. In fact, we should try and get in touch with the management and see if they want to comment on this particular piece of news as well. Without knowing the details of the deal, like the, I mean, mm. I think one can broadly make the statement that 
uh, the, the bankruptcy code and NCLT and the threat of the bankruptcy IBC is actually working and mm -hmm. I mean you know it's maybe forced the company to arrive at some sort of a settlement agreement uh, or uh, so we, as I said we need the uh, details but LIC has basically withdrawn its petition uh, at the NCLT so there is nothing the loan now. amount was 31 crores I think okay. LIC housing finance was trying to refer was trying to recover a loan worth around 31 crores mm. to DB Realty so now they've withdrawn that application to the NCLT for DB Realty because they've settled it outside uh, court so that's actually a big positive and maybe a precursor in terms of what could probably come as well possible uh, but I mean <clears throat> uh, we maybe as you said we need to sort mm. of speak with the management at uh, either of the two companies to better understand where at what stage was this at I mean was this petition actually accepted by the NCLT uh, uh, or no, it was I before it was that just, it, it I was think just it was filed. just yeah it just took so place very, very recently stages. the news I think was just one or two weeks so I was old. wondering whether uh, yeah, 17 18 yeah. percent rally is warranted or not uh, I mean in that case at but least they're not in NCLT <laughs> now <laughs> but anyway 31 crores is uh, the loan outstanding amount with LIC housing finance which now stands settled. Markets come off a little bit, 10 points again on the Nifty. We're at about 10,242. Mr. Uwar Bud is director of Dalton Capital Advisors and he's joining us from our studios here. Mr. Bud, thanks very much. Good morning. Pleasure. Uh, what do you, how do you assess rather prospects for the market from here? Well, I think the market continues to be range bound um, and uh, I think there could be a negative bias. This is what I think because the market has reached uh, all time highs and uh, very difficult to find uh, new reasons for why it should go there. So therefore, I think uh, given the quarterly earnings, uh, the way it is going, given the problems that we have internationally, I think uh, it is not impossible for us to believe that there could be a, a correction, maybe a mild correction, it may not collapse. But I think uh, the market find new highs every day may be difficult without good reason. We just finished a 5% correction, uh, which finished in late uh, September, that, right? That has been recovered uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty soon. <laughs> Actually, we've had two 5% corrections since August. Yeah. Uh, you know, the last about three, two and a half, three months or so. so but a correction needs to be remembered only uh, if it doesn't recover from there. Uh, but so it has been uh, the market has recovered very soon. Mm. And I, uh, I mean, very difficult to justify why it uh, recovered. Mm. Uh, there was no great uh, you know, news coming from anywhere, any positive news coming. So it is just market, uh, you know, just liquidity that is running it. And uh, you have seen such, uh, you know, uh, very, very uh, sustainable selling by uh, FII. So, so therefore, they don't seem to be in a mood to uh, buy at these valuations. Mm. So it is domestic flows that are, uh, that are dictating uh, the market. Mm. So we don't know when uh, these things can change, when someone says that, you know, the valuations are too expensive. So therefore, we should wait. Mm. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Pat, what is your sense in terms of what's happening with the NPA issue? Because for now, you know, the incremental kind of uh, news that we've got from all of the banks that have announced numbers, say the federal banks of the world or maybe the DCBs, either the slippages are lower on a sequential basis or either the management commentary is positive that, you know, corporate loan slippage wasn't as much for federal bank and that, that's where they saw that uh, improvement come through. So what's your sense in terms of where the NPA problem stands and we have positive news for DB Realty as well right now? Well, I think the NPA problem is largely uh, with, got to do with PSU banks. I think the private sector banks have managed this uh, reasonably well. Either they have not lent to all those uh, who became NPAs, hmm. or otherwise they've managed to provide for it. Hmm. But it's the large uh, PSU banks which have a serious problem. Hmm. And there, I think the bigger issue is one of not new NPAs, but even migration of the, the current NPAs, where they have provided 15-25%, they will have to increasingly start providing for another 15-25%, uh, take it to mm. 40%. So that migration from uh, uh, you know, the first level of uh, NPA to the second level. Mm. So they really don't have capital, they don't have profits. Uh, so therefore, I think uh, you cannot have a system where you know, two-thirds of, two of the system is not working and the rest of the one-third should carry the load. Mm. So I think that is where I think something has to be done. Either they have to recapitalize in a big way uh, you know, much uh, probably um, higher by a factor of 10 than what they they have been talking hitherto, or otherwise, uh, I think the, the private sector banks have to rapidly gain market share, mm. which they are doing it. Which anyway. they are doing. Yeah. Uh, this uninterrupted uh, run for NBFCs, mm. when we had that correction, seemed like it was uh, stopping a bit. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the market's fully recovered. It's made a new high, yeah. but uh, a lot of these NBFCs have not recovered. I mean, they're not making new highs. Some maybe one or two. Yeah. Uh, what do you make of uh, that? I mean, that space. And when I talk about NBFCs, it's a whole lot of sectors there, but mainly consumer lenders. 
See, I think structurally there is a huge uh, change that is happening there. That is what the market is recognizing. That is why they are finding themselves in a sweet spot. Basically, they are gaining market share because quite a lot of uh, the consumer lending used to happen uh, uh, in the PSU sector also. Mm -hmm. Now, that is virtually gone because they are not in a position to lend anymore. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, that is where the, the market share gains is, uh, are there. And uh, even pricing is there because if to those the market is not able to finance the growth uh, of the consumer uh, finance segment, then I think uh, it is the NBFCs which are, do, which are partaking in that. And they are doing it quite, uh, quite profitably. Did you look at Bajaj Finance, I mean, the, big, the biggest of the yesterday reported numbers. Numbers are fine. I mean, there was some nitpicking about expectations being a little higher and they just about matching, uh, managing to meet, etc. But all in all, numbers were quite okay, Bajaj Finance. You think? Did you look no, at I, the numbers? I can't talk about specific stuff. <laughs> okay, you can't talk about Okay, okay, okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Fair uh -huh. enough. Uh, Mr. Bhatt, what's your sense in terms of at least uh, the consumption theme? Mm. Because everyone's worried GST uh, impact, but we're seeing you know the high frequency data points actually being quite positive. Credit growth has recovered for the month of September in terms yeah. of provisional data, and we have the auto sales as well. Yeah. So where are we at? Well, I think uh, the consumer uh, um, consumer theme is playing out. Mm. Uh, the better companies there are doing very well. Mm. Uh, there is no doubt. But even uh, even despite the GST uh, problems, I think they've even gained uh, in terms of volumes. Mm. So therefore, the better companies do very well. But it is the companies which are not able to negotiate the problems with GST, especially where they have a lot of uh, small scale vendors. Uh, that is where I think the, the largest amount of dislocation has uh, affected. Hmm. But even then, now we are uh, you know, almost two months uh, since, uh, uh, I mean, we are we're quite some distance uh, after uh, this was introduced, more than two months. So therefore, I think things are settling down. Uh, so I don't think it is much as, as so much of a serious problem as it used to be a month ago. So are you buying, selling, uh, sec with sectors at least this Diwali? Well, the only sectors where you see, are seeing growth, uh, despite all the talk of uh, you know, slowdown and all that, is uh, you know, auto, hmm. uh, non-PSU bank financial services sector. Hmm. Um, I mean, these are the two sectors that are doing well. And I think, I mean, if you see export data, uh, things seem to be happening there. So therefore, I think there are sectors like uh, you know, auto ancillaries, uh, hmm. which are uh, engineering exports have been very good. So therefore, that is another uh, sub-sector, I think, uh, which might do well. As we head into summer 2074, uh, CNBC TV 18 has been getting you the biggest and the best voices of the last street. Here is the big bull himself, Rakesh Chunjunwala, with his take on the market. From 7,800 rise to 10,200. I, I won't predict any floor. But I feel the money supply into equity is going to increase. The foreign signaling is going to moderate. The earnings are going to be very good, right? And the screen sh says they refuse to go down. Nine out of ten people I meet are bearish. I don't find anybody very anxious to buy shares. So then I think we are just at the start of what is going to be a very, 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 very long bull market.